<laughs> oh, finally. Hi there. Welcome back to my kitchen, everyone. I apologize again for being late. Again. Uh, there was a lot of prep work involved here, and I tried. I was doing my best to get everything done as soon as I could. I mean, I, I want to I'd say that I have a habit of being early. Never seems to happen with these live chats. So, yeah, I believe me, next time I will try to be as fast and as quick as possible. That's what she said. Okay. <clears throat> um, okay, good. We are running with a uh, live, with a, uh, an Ethernet connection. So hopefully there should not be any delays. But anyway, okay. Thank you once again uh, for showing up. Uh, once as stated, this is essentially part two of last week's topic, which had to do with uh, cast iron cauldrons, because after all, thank, uh, yeah, Thanksgiving, uh, Halloween is uh, showing, uh, Halloween is uh, only three days away, finally, and um, that means, you know, of course, now is a really good time to make something in a, uh, cast, in a cast iron cauldron, and that's really what I was hoping to do. Uh, last week, I did a lot of talking about, uh, ca about uh, different kinds of cauldrons. T tonight, I figured I'd uh, go th the other direction and actually do some cooking. Uh, hopefully, yeah, hopefully, this is something that may inspire you to uh, try doing this on Halloween night or, in fact, any other night. Uh, because really, there's nothing wrong with uh, making th these dishes at any time of the year. <laughs> I'm not doing those silly feet loaf or zombie meatloaf type of things. Uh, this one is a little bit more generic, but I hope you like it anyway. Two of my favorite uh, dishes to make in a cauldron, one of which I will be uh, making uh, just right about now, will be uh, what I mentioned last week called ground nut stew or peanut butter chicken. Because not only is it delicious, really, the sight of it bubbling in this cauldron here really certainly does <laughs> look like you're making a witch's potion, and that's why I'm looking forward to it. The other dish, um, which I've already started, and it should hopefully be uh, ready by the time I'm done with this, you know, by the time uh, we're approaching the end of this video, is uh, Kal Cannon which I have also talked about. Uh, the Cull Cannon is um, right over here in, let's do this right. There we are, in a Griswold uh, Dutch oven, which is as good a cauldron as you can have. Um, this is, a, uh, of these two, I'm hoping, again, these are dishes that your kids would like because um, hopefully they'll be intrigued enough by the idea of peanut butter chicken that uh, they may want to uh, give it a try, and I think it's delicious. On the other hand, call cannon should be no problem because you can always call it extreme mashed potatoes, which is basically what it is. <laughs> and uh, once those are done, uh, we can go on to dessert, which is what I'm holding in my hand. Now, uh, here's another uh, cute little thing that uh, really I only stumbled across recently, but I was intrigued enough to give it a try. I mean, after all, Everybody likes uh, chocolate pudding in a uh, cast iron cauldron, right? Well, especially when your kids try to uh, actually try to actually eat it, and they find they are eating what you can call chocolate slime, because technically that's what this is. Or you may better know it as oobleck. Yes, this is an edible type of uh, oobleck that uh, fluid that uh, they love to talk about. They call it non-Newtonian because it's uh, essentially it reacts to uh, pressure in that by itself it's in a liquid state, but if it's uh, but if you apply any um, any physical force to it, it becomes solid. And so you can uh, and so you can literally say that you are serving yeah to your kids that you are serving them chocolate slime. And just think what it'll be like when you when you get to ooze this over, say, a bowl of ice cream or the like. It's a bit different from chocolate pudding, and um, the recipe is actually pretty simple. This one here is no more than a cup, no quarter cup, one quarter cup of cocoa powder, um, half a cup of uh, actually I believe it was three quarters of a cup of powdered sugar and a cup of uh, cornstarch, and maybe just a little dash of, um, of vanilla extract. And then from there, you mix in enough milk to give it the right consistency. 
I believe this came to about three quarters of a cup of milk, but uh, doing this is like doing it with gravy in that you start adding it a little bit at a time and you uh, stir it until it reaches the right consistency. And the thing is when you're stirring it, it will still look far too thick. What you're gonna have to do is every so often pause and see if it gets to the uh, nice, see if it gets nice and jiggly the way it's uh, doing right here. So yeah, if I, were to, uh, if I were to do this too much, it would actually fall out. But as you can see, it's so thick that um, definitely you can tell them that this is oozing chocolate slime. <laughs> so I thought I'd uh, start with dessert and then we can uh, work our way backwards. Because uh, what I'm starting here now will be the main course, which, as I mentioned, is the ground nut stew, which I am, which we will be making in a um, in the uh, best duty cast iron poiki. Oh, your daughter guessed what it was. Bookworm seventy three. <laughs> Kudos to her. Thumbs up. Well, I hope you try it, and I hope you enjoy it too. So. How is Mr. Kitty? Oh, he's doing fine, actually. And yeah, uh, hopefully I'll be able to give him a shot because after all, what you've got when you have a uh, witch's cauldron, you've got to have a black cat to go with it. So, <laughs> um, as I mentioned last week, well, let me get one important thing, a pot holder. As I mentioned last week, this is a uh, Best Duty brand um, Boiki. And that's the other thing. A couple of people from uh, South Africa, or Africa at least, have pointed out rather indignantly that no, it, they don't pronounce it Pudgy, even though it looks like it. They pronounce it Poiki. So I, out of respect for them, that's I guess that's what this is going to be. This is actually an Asian-made brand, Best Duty, which still works just fine. I've been using this for the past several years. And so I've got a uh, really nice uh, seasoning uh, on the inside here. It looks nice and smooth. When this first came in, when this first came in, it had the rough sandpaper-like surface that you expect from uh, Asian-made cast iron, and this is no exception. But as I said, constant use is really what has seasoned this up to the way it should be. And that, again, is another reason why there's no reason not to use Asian cast iron if you don't have, I mean, if you don't have political objections. If you do, that's your business, and I'm not trying to tell you otherwise. Okay, so that means getting started on that. Uh, we are, da, 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 da. oh yeah, fortunately I did my best to do all my prep work. Uh, you know, mise en place. And that means all I need to do is dig out a little bit of my oil. And we will get started with our chicken. 100% vegetarian fed chicken. Gee, does that mean you feed this, you feed this thing vegans? <laughs> really nice. We've got cannibal chicken here, um, which is rather appropriate for Halloween. Nonetheless, uh, all we're doing is we start out the usual way by browning, our, browning ourselves up some chicken thighs. Uh, I do not rinse off my chicken, and uh, there, there is a reason for that, because rinsing off your chicken really is not, uh, going, to, uh, not going to change the, uh, how the uh, finished chicken will, cook at, will uh, turn out. It tends to spread those chicken cooties and the salmonella and everything all over your sink area. And furthermore, you're not going to be contaminated because we're cooking this chicken, meaning that it's going to be at a, uh, you know, we're bringing it up to a uh, temperature where, where any uh, bacteria or the like will definitely be killed. So, um, and there are references I cannot point you to. Uh, so it's not just me saying that. I mean, as you know, all too well, you hear, hey, watch this YouTube video for the truth. No, I prefer to do references or as they say, do your research. But when I say that, don't go to some stupid conspiracy biased site net that probably relies more on conspiracy theories. Uh, yeah, I do tend to uh, trust the man when it comes to things like science. So because of that, I tend to go with the idea that, no, you don't have to rinse off your chicken. <laughs> and in a second or so, we will be, uh, heating, we'll be heating this up. 
you need to give Kitty some screen time. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm going to uh, make, I'm going to be certain of that. So <laughs> anyway, um, as I mentioned, uh, this point, this Boiki here is uh, a number three size, which in African term, African manufacturer terms, that means this is about eight liters in size, or in other words, just a little more than nine quarts. So this should be big enough to make all of this chicken. And I'm definitely looking forward to it. Um, I will also say again, you know, this is still a uh, live chat, you know, it's a, a, and I'm still open to doing a Q&A here while I'm busy stirring this chicken. So please don't hesitate. Um, after all, again, drain off. Oh, damn it. Excuse me. Time out. And I know why, too. Uh, yeah, my smoke alarm works, as you can see. I haven't done anything, and it and it, and it already causes it to go off. So, <laughs> oh well. You know what they also say is that if you um, if half of your instructions say to uh, shut off the smoke detector, then I'm sorry, half of your recipes say to shut off the smoke detector, you might have cast ironitis. So away we go. Oh, yeah. Another nice thing about a pot instead of a pan, there is a bit of splatter here, but fortunately, most of it, most of it is being contained. And there we go. found a cauldron the other day for 600 bucks. Oh, but I don't know what is good or bad, and I don't know any corner specifically. Yeah, actually, that is a very good point. And I'm, I believe the mic should be positioned okay that you can hear me even over this chicken. Uh, and uh, this noise is going to go down in just a couple of minutes. But even so, if you can't hear me over this, please tell me. However, that is a subject... When looking over last week's video, I regret and I apologize because that's a very important subject when it comes to cast iron cauldrons here. Namely, what if you come across a cast iron cauldron, something that looks really attractive? It could be in somebody's front yard. It could be at an antique mall um, or maybe even on eBay, heaven forbid. Uh, also, $600. Holy cow. Oh, shit. Really, I mean, if you're going to spend that much on a cauldron, all I could say is you really better be sure you're getting a lot of use out of that. Whew, $600 is a lot of money, even for a cast iron pot. Um, I know there, there may be reasons why you feel it may be worth it, and that really is up to you. I can't, I can't say no to that, only that I feel that if you have patience, you can find yourself probably a better deal than that. Um, let me say, you know, that big 15 gallon cauldron, the one that I've been, uh, I've been talking about so much recently and that I made that video of the jambalaya with, uh, I found that one at the Brimfield antique show. And I will tell you how much I paid for it. $150. And that was why when, when he offered it to me at that price, I mean, I knew this was like a once-in-a-lifetime bargain. You know, we're talking like a savory uh, 19, eight, yeah, 19th century uh, gigantic cast-iron cauldron. And when I, when I looked it over, I mean, yeah, it was in fine condition. Yes, there was pitting on the inside. In fact, um, let me see. It was the very last day of the Brimfield show. It was Sunday, in fact. And so it was actually fairly late in the afternoon. So obviously... The guy was lowering his price because, you know, that thing weighs 75 pounds. And I'm sure he would much rather have gotten rid of it than uh, had to lug that thing all the way back home to whatever state he lived in. So because of that, he actually uh, he actually agreed to $150, which is still a fair amount of money, not what I was planning for. But like I said, I could afford it at that time. And I knew, again, if I said no, I'd be kicking myself for the rest of my life. 
And so because of that, I ended up uh, getting it. Now, as I said, I paid $150. I did not pay $600 for that. But on the other hand, I am not in your position. I don't know your finances. I don't know how often you'll use it if you, can re if you really need it. Because there are cheaper alternatives available. For instance, for maybe half that price, you can get yourself a modern Asian-made, yes, but still a modern jambalaya pot from, uh, say, Bayou Classic or what's the other big one? King Cooker. If you look on Amazon, you can see, you can see those, and uh, they uh, sell them, and you know they're brand new. Um, as I mentioned, I have a Bayou Classic 16-quart or 4-gallon Dutch oven, and it uh, works just fine. I have no problem at all with that. So all things considered, if you feel 600 is fair price for you, or maybe you can haggle or something, well, that's really your choice. And if you want to go for it, well, okay, that's the other thing. Check it out. I mean, uh, the two uh, pro real big problems with uh, cauldrons these days, I mean, especially the vintage ones, are, of course, number one, they might be damaged. Someone could have uh, used it as a planter. There could be holes punched into the bottom of it. Huh. Sad to say, but many cauldrons these days have suffered that fate. And if you look on the bottom, of course, they're pretty easy to see. Now, it is true that holes, small holes in a cauldron, yes, they can be plugged. If you can find someone good enough to uh, repair cast iron, like maybe using nickel welds or something, it is possible that it can be done. Or maybe even put plating over it, say like steel plate or something over or underneath it, and then seal that up. So maybe that might work. Um, the other thing is, of course, cracks. And that's the other real problem with vintage cast iron. You have to check those things carefully to make sure that they're not cracked. Um, and, I mean, after all, think of the Liberty Bell, you know, the uh, United States Liberty Bell. The legend goes, and as far as I know, it's true. It only rang once, and it cracked immediately, and has uh, been in that state ever since. Now, notice they did not take the time to have that crack fixed, because that was a gigantic crack. It still is. And the only way they could have uh, fixed that is to really melt the whole thing down and cast another one. But they have not done that, and so we have the famous Liberty Bell today. But cracks are both real serious. Uh, boiler hunky do. In my opinion, some pitting in a vintage feet pot cauldron isn't as bad on a, uh, as on a skillet. Oh, I agree. You won't be frying eggs in a pot. Now, like I said, if I may, check out that video that I just posted, the jambalaya video. I may, And you can see the inside of, of my 15-gallon uh, pot. It is, in fact, quite pitted. It's got a very rough and pitted surface on the inside, which may be another reason why he sold it to me for so relatively cheap. Um, I had no problem at all making it. As you, uh, the, and even I even showed a uh, bit at the end of when, uh, when I was scraping the rice out at the bottom of that pot. There was no sticking. There was no problem at all. I love that pot, and I'm glad I made the investment in it. Um, because, yeah, no. A uh, rough inside, if you, if you feel that you can get a, a lot of use out of it, then I'd say, again, go for it. That's As I said, I'm not here to dictate to you because I don't know, again, I don't know your situation. I don't know your financial status or your need for it. Maybe you've got yourself a business, for instance. Maybe you've got your own restaurant or something, and it would be a really great selling point to say, hey, we make... We make our jambalaya here in a, in a uh, vintage uh, cast iron cauldron. For that reason, maybe $600 might be a good investment. Um, that might be up to you. Uh, somebody else, what size is the poiki? A number three? Yes, this is exactly a number three, in fact. The sizes on those things seem to range from about one half, which I think is like the one quart size we, see, we have here, all, all the way up to maybe number four, five, or six. And I think just a number six are those gigantic pots, you know, the, the legendary ones, the ones that are bigger than even the ones we see here in America, the ones that are like, oh, I don't know, 
50 gallons or so in size. I think that's only maybe a number six or maybe a number nine. I don't know. I don't know the sizes for poikis, but they are very different from what we have for cast iron here in the USA. And yeah, I crowded the pot. There's a lot of water in this thing. I think I will see what I can do about draining some of it. Uh, let's, let's dig something out, shall we? Actually, I goofed again. Even though I've got this, I should get myself a little container for it. Here we are. As you know, that's the problem with chicken. If you crowd the pot, you end up getting a lot of liquid. But it's really not a problem. All we'll do is remove this. And in fact, over time, it cooks to the point where the liquid dries up and you can, and sometimes you can even add this back into the pot. And by doing this, you can hear actually, it becomes more of a sizzle, which means we are getting, which means I think this is fine. Let's place this over here. So, that was my point here. Uh, Ms. French Twist. My grandmother used to use a huge one for washing. It was put over a fire outside to boil clothes. And, oh, yeah, I think that's probably what most of those huge uh, cauldrons are used for. I mean, as, I mean, after all, you have to wash clothes, what? Especially with a big family, what? Once a week at least? Um, so it's more likely that those things were probably used for washing clothes a lot more than they were used for cooking it. And yes, I wouldn't be surprised if they used the same pot for cooking and for, uh, for washing clothes because, and I'm not even gonna get into sanitary stuff. But I mean, after all, you know, again, if you clean that thing out and you, um, and you properly heat it, and here I'm not even going to go into like over a fire, uh, no. Uh, but if you properly heat it and season it, then um, even though my, again, even though my cauldron was probably used for um, washing clothes, I'm cooking in it and I'm definitely not contaminated. I mean, I did my best to clean that pot up and it is seasoned and I also heated it to the point, again, where anything bad in it would have been uh, killed long ago, hopefully years ago. Yeah, that's way over my budget, $600. Like 100, I like 100 or 150, so I could, uh, that I could swing 600, I'd have to be financially independent. Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, we like it or not, we have to be realistic. I mean, if I've um, disappointed you, I apologize, but, like you said, we have to be realistic. And yes, I do feel you can pro that one of these days you will find a uh, much better deal on a on a cauldron. Um, I don't know where. Maybe you may have to go on a road trip down south and see if you might come across one that way. Or you may be lucky and you might have a giant antique fair. Well, I've said Brimfield enough times. There are a few others of those in, in different parts of the country. Or who knows? Um, I will say again that I do not recommend buying a cauldron on eBay. Number one, they're almost always ridiculously overpriced. I think we've talked about eBay prices. You know, typically it's about three times what you, you should expect to pay. Uh, number two, with an eBay seller, well, you can't examine it in person. You don't know what the condition of it is like unless you're getting it absolutely brand new. And so if you're getting it brand new, you might as well buy it, like, say, from Amazon. They do sell Bayou Classic Cauldrons on eBay, but, hey, they also sell them on Amazon. Uh, number three, it could be damaged in shipping. I mean, as we know all too well, cast iron actually is fragile. And even a big pot like that could be cracked or worse during shipping. So maybe not, but maybe so. So for something like a huge cauldron, I would have to say, if you can't pick it up, you're, no, not true. I just said buying from Amazon. Uh, no, don't buy a vintage cauldron on eBay. Let's leave it at that, I guess. Hmm. Uh, what are you going to cook up for Halloween? Well, as a matter of fact, um, tomorrow is my last day of work before my vacation. And on Friday, I'm heading out to visit my friends in New York, who I have talked about enough times. I am going to see my dear friends, Panic Bedlam and Anthony Bonafini, both of whom are genuine occultists. So 
Um, I'm, you know, well, I have said, I have mentioned cooking magic and that's actually what I plan to do. I'm not going into detail on the, about that at this time, because we're here, I know for the cooking, um, more for that. Although on the other hand, Hey, it is Halloween, but I'm actually thinking fool that I am doing yet another jambalaya. No, not in the 15 gallon cauldron. I can't fit that thing. Well, no, I can fit it in my car, but I'm not going to go lugging that thing out into the middle of New York State. On the other hand, I'm planning to bring the Bayou Classic one, the uh, four-gallon pot, and set up my burner, hopefully right there. They happen to live in a uh, nice uh, downtown area. I'm not saying any more of that, but hopefully I'll be able to set up my... Um, cauldron right on their right on their front lawn assuming i have permission that's the first thing and get out and uh dress up you know it is halloween and make a big uh pot of jambalaya right there in front in for everybody to see especially since trick-or-treating is discouraged or canceled or whatever you want to call it i'm hoping that may at least provide some entertainment for some people and that's my plan for halloween during the day as for the night, well, I'm actually, I'm thinking I'll likely be doing something else, something a little more mystical with, uh, again, with Panic and Antony and uh, who knows who else. So, but that is a subject for another time. Hmm. Uh, yeah, I am considering this to be something of a special Halloween for a couple of reasons. One is, as we mentioned already, this is like one of those rare conjunctions, you know. Happens to fall on a Saturday, which is a great night for our late night stuff, as well as a Halloween full moon, which is uh, rare in itself. The next full moon apparently is not until like the year, I don't know, 2030 something. And even then it's going to fall on a Tuesday. So a, a Saturday Halloween full moon is a very rare moment. And for rare moments, it's, you know, it's nice to try to do something special. Which is why I'm glad I'm going to be doing that with friends. <laughs> now, science says, big deal. It's just coincidence. And I don't disagree with that. I very much enjoy and I respect and I, and I trust science for a lot of things. But I see no reason why I can't have fun as well. And that is where a lot of my mystical belief or religious belief or whatever you call it comes into and that is having fun with things that really are not in the realm of science you know such as you know such as friend friendship love and those kind of things <laughs> anyway yeah halloween is also daylight savings oh yeah that too wow so we're actually spring forward fall back. We're actually getting an extra hour on top of everything else. Hua! Hi, Raymond. Hi. If I got a gate... No, I got a gate mark number 10 last week. 80 bucks. Yeah, it was a little pitting. Finally, it's set up my lie tank. Okay, nice. Gate mark number 10. Um, are we talking skillet or cauldron? Even if it's a skillet, you know, a number 10, those are very rare for those gate mark ones. Those, you know, the most common, of course, num uh, gate mark ones are like the size eight, maybe seven, sometimes even a six. Those are very common, and you shouldn't have to pay a lot for those. But a number 10 is very rare. I mean, congratulations on that. If you feel that it was worth $80, then I very much, again, congratulate you on your score. So if I say that a lot, if you feel it's worth it, I think that's really the uh, whole point. And at this point, I think this chicken is likely browned. So, from here, holy cow, we're already almost 30 minutes into this thing? Good grief. Can't believe that. Nonetheless, let's keep going. Uh, now that we have done this, it's time to eat the pot. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, yeah. I haven't even had my onions. My bad. Onions. I have onions and saute, so the onions are soft. I probably should have done this at least a few minutes ago. I'm running behind. Well, as I mentioned, tomorrow is my last day before vacation, so I'm going to enjoy myself. And, of course, anybody here is free to leave whenever they get bored. I'm doing my best not to bore people, though. 
<laughs> okay, add, add onion slices until the onions are soft. Then we've got to add some uh, ginger and garlic. Now, I did not have time, unfortunately, to chop up some garlic, cloves, and ginger, which is a shame. But no, I actually kind of ran out of time, I'm afraid. So I'll have to go with garlic and ginger. So be it. And then once we do that, uh, da, 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 add onion slices and saute. He wait one minute. Raise the stove top temperature. Add the chicken. Add sweet potato. Okay, yeah. So after that, all right. I think we can throw in these things anyway. So we're talking like some garlic. Kind of winging it here. The recipe I'm using, which which I do have on my website, uh, does have more specifics. But as I said, at this point, I'm just kind of guessing, you know, because we got, there we go. We've got some ginger and we have some garlic. And actually, there really isn't too much more to this. After this, we'll be throwing in uh, the rest of the essential ingredients. Besides, at this point, these onions are already starting to uh, caramelize. Yay, cast iron. <laughs> so from here, let's check the uh, comments once again. Uh, thumbs up. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> Sometimes it is a cooking channel. What are you making? I am making peanut butter chicken. This is an African recipe, very common and very popular in Africa, and they call it ground nut stew. What are ground nuts? They are peanuts. Because after all, they, well, I know, pe peanuts are not nuts. They're a kind of pea, yet we call them nuts. So, and they come from the ground, hence ground nuts. All right. <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, are you a Satanist? No, I am not. I follow chaos. I do not follow Satan. I know Satan. I've, uh, you know, I dated a Satanist. And I've uh, and I have occasionally hung out with folks from the OTO. I will not deny that. I am not a Satanist. So, um, I apologize if I have offended any Christians. I am just uh, telling people the truth. <laughs> Speaking of which, you know, you notice how Halloween actually is also known as Samhain in uh, pagan traditions, and also, of course, it also happens to be. Dia de Muertos, which, as uh, folks, some folks know, that is the Day of the Dead. That's where, again, a lot of folks pay their respect to the dead. Um, I've known about Dia de Muertos. I learned a lot about it. About it, yes, with that with that wonderful Pixar movie Coco. I really, really enjoyed it. And is it just me, or I think Coco? has popularized Dia de Muertos a lot more in that, especially this year, I'm seeing a lot more of those uh, decorated skull um, decorations, you know, for Dia de Muertos than I, than I think I've seen in the past. And we're talking places like Dollar Tree, for instance. Who do you vote for? I went over that. I'm not saying any more about voting for until next Wednesday. Uh, also, New Year's for the Wicca, definitely. And yeah, you could get into a long discussion about that, you know, how uh, Samhain was was and still is very popular, and then it became... Oops, oh yeah, that's right, I have that pen heating up. Well, that's going to come in a minute. <laughs> and then it became All Hallows' Eve, but eh, again, that's politics, which I'm really not going to get into. Uh, at least not tonight. Okay, now that we have wasted all this time, finally, let's add another unique ingredient. That would be some sweet potatoes, which I've uh, already chopped up. I'll do my best to try to prepare for that. And along with sweet potatoes, regular potatoes too. These are white potatoes to be precise. So this is doing a great job filling up this pot, which is one, re again, a great reason to have a big cast iron pot here. So yeah, we are getting somewhere already. The whole point here is once everything is added, 
Uh, we're just going to fill this with uh, water. It says chicken broth, but I, unfortunately, I'm out of chicken broth tonight, and no reason you can't use water. Uh, and then I'm going to simmer this for an hour and a half. Uh, no, I do not intend to still be live in an hour and a half, but don't worry, I've got other plans for that. So, once we get all this in, I'm going to chicken all around, and we've done some of the seasoning, so at this point, now from here, we get to add in a few other uh, interesting ingredients. And where did I put it? Here it is. Some uh, diced tomatoes, and hey, by the way, Notice I use that method for opening a can opener. <laughs> you know, the one that seems to be is becoming like the number three or number two uh, video on my channel. <laughs> I was always amused by that. I mean, to be honest, I made it on a whim on a Saturday morning, and it took all of about five minutes, and yet this thing has just taken off. It's like, as I said, I've made stews, I've made cakes, I've made pies, I've made roasts, made lots of big things, busting big beans, and yet, what's the video that really has gone crazy on my channel? How to open, how to use a can opener. <laughs> oh, well. And we have some tomatoes, and yes, I'll talk about tomatoes and cast iron as well. I haven't even finished the subject of what happens if you, if you get yourself a cauldron, because once you've gotten a cauldron, well, what about uh, when, you, when you've got it, and it's all rusty and everything? Um, okay, where was I? Sweet potatoes. Da, 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 da. Okay, now from here we do some diced bell pepper. This time I did some orange bell pepper. It's a little sweeter than green. And anyway, the orange has a nice Halloween -y type of touch to it. And also some hot sauce, which uh, right now I'm just going to use some cayenne pepper. I'm not a fan of uh, hot sauces that destroy your mouth. That's probably more than enough, in fact. So, we okay, now that we've taken care of that, uh, and had hot pepper, we'll mix that around a little bit more, and then we'll get to the other main ingredient. And that would be peanuts. Because as we said, this is peanut butter chicken. So what we have here it are two cups of peanuts. Uh, they, are, they are roasted peanuts. They're not uncooked. You could probably use uncooked peanuts, but I use the cooked ones. But they are unsalted. And in addition to this, uh, here it is, two cups of peanut butter. I measured it out in advance to make, to make this go a little faster. And this is the part here, once everything settles down, it's going to uh, start bubbling like a witch's cauldron. And that's, I find, one of the uh, more attractive things about making this dish. It looks, nice. it looks neat. So let's do our best to stir this in. Was, hey, this is a cooking channel. Look at this. We're actually doing some cooking. How about that? Well, as a matter of fact, we've got another dish coming after this. Yes. Yeah, even though this is a big poiki, you can see this is almost full. <laughs> All right, now that we've done that, we're going to add a few other things. Namely, some ground coriander. Coriander is a really nice spice for meat. In fact, they use that especially for when making things like pastrami. Uh, chili powder, which I know I got that out. Where did I put it? Oh, staring me in the face, of course. A little bit of chili powder. And yeah, like I said, I'm still winging it here. A little bit of curry. Always do that. I don't know why I keep those tops on it. I never use them. A little bit of curry. Which will stain my fingers if I'm not careful. 
And one other ingredient, which it may not be in many ground nut stews, but it's here. And that is a little bit of molasses. I found the sweetness of molasses goes well with this, and it also adds to the consistency nicely. Don't need to do a lot of it, though. Probably about this much. <laughs> my best to try to stir this up. Fortunately, after this, I'm just going to top all this off with water. So that won't be so hard. Move over on this direction. Yeah, those of you who are much better cooks than I am are probably cringing at the way I'm attempting to stir this. I am open to criticism and any tips on this very much appreciated. <laughs> um, okay, let me just find this thing here. Scrape this up. So this is an interesting concoction. Sweet potatoes, peanut butter, a little bit of cayenne pepper, some curry, coriander, and of course the chicken. And now that we've done all that, we're actually just about done here. From here, I did forget a container. Okay, then I will have to just do it the hard way. I think I'll do this one. Thank you for your patience once again. This is the hot water. And my sink happens to get really hot. Hey, actually, that was quite a bit of water for that. Or it filled it up very nicely. So on the whole, I'd say if you were using chicken broth, you probably would not need more than one container of it. Because look at that. Now that we have filled all of this up, from here, we lower the heat. Cover the boiki. And let it simmer for about an hour and a half. <laughs> However, we are not done yet. Let me turn this up because uh, I gotta turn this down. Gotta change things around a little bit. Let's see if I can get this right. Move this over here. Wow, holy crap. Okay. And move this over here. Uh, okay, good. All right, now, now that we've done that, <laughs> notice we have brought out a skillet here. That's because we are going to be moving on to the next dish at this point. The skillet, by the way, is... Uh, None other than, well, I'm thinking of calling this guy Lightning. I've showed him off before. He, this is a Birmingham Stove and Range number seven uh, size skillet, which is the same size pretty much as you would find in a typical large skillet. Um, it, this is uh, a handwritten pan. It has the, uh, you know, definitely handwritten markings. And these markings here, they are not cracks. They are casting flaws, in fact. I mean, this pan was probably made from a, mold that was nearly worn out. And because of that, it ended up with these marks here, which again are not cracks. The inside works just fine. So because of this, also the fact that this thing does a really great job on uh, cooking, I've uh, called, I've tended, I've uh, called this pan lightning. <clears throat> Let's move up, get a little better view of that. There we are. Because once this thing gets all uh, hot enough, next step is for the cold cannon, no less. We're going to be using some sausages. <laughs> and here's where I'm glad that smoke detector is, is uh, closed off. Where did those cats go? One second, please. I'm not sure. 
Let me check the office. Thank you for your patience, everyone. Everybody in here? I don't see them. Well, they're well hidden. Apologize for that. But nonetheless, okay. Oh, good. That's a good sign there. So, now that we've done that, let's get around to the next step. For the cold cannon, I'm going to be using about three nice Italian sausages. Actually, I better get myself just a wee bit of grease, not much, but just a bit. Now, technically, cold cannon, a couple of things about that. That is an Irish dish, yes, I know, which means that if I was honest, I would probably be using British bangers. But British bangers are a little hard to find here in the United States. And anyway, ooh, I missed that. And anyway this is really meant for um, pretty much whatever meat you have on hand. So in this case, I'm using some Italian sausages. So anyway, no garlic or ginger. Oh yeah, um, I do have garlic and I do have ginger. What I didn't have was time to chop them up, unfortunately. I was in kind of a rush to get everything all uh, prepared in time for this. <laughs> so I had to uh, cheat and use garlic powder and ginger powder. Nothing wrong with that. <laughs> Spicy and peanut butter go well together. Well, I certainly hope so. <laughs> ah, the sizzle like the cornbread. Yes, indeed. That's the best way to cook sausages. And actually, once these sausages are ready, I'm thinking we'll be able to do the cold cannon, which I actually prepared before this video started. It has it is uh, boiling right now so that it will be ready to come out and mash when these uh, sausages are done. I kind of regret doing this now. I wish I had started these sausages at least a few minutes ago. Well, we will do what we can. Oh, am I getting too close to the burner there? <laughs> it might be. Nonetheless, come on. Can I just turn this over? There we go. So there's a start for you. Anyway, as I mentioned, this is this BSR does a great job cooking sausages and other kinds of meats. I'm definitely looking forward to this. Hmm. Do I have the right kind of lid for this? Number seven. Oh, let's try this, shall we? Yeah. This large lid looks like it may be close enough. Okay, good. I'll keep an eye on that then. Now, meanwhile, back to our subject, I guess. Uh, be nice and hit the like button. Well, yes, that would be nice. But... Okay, where do you get your or most of your recipes from? Well, welcome to the 21st century. I get them from the internet. <laughs> well, I mean, quite literally, it's like I... Well, also, I'm fortunate enough to be on the Cast Iron Cooking Group, and there are a lot of... There are 370,000-plus people on there all cooking their favorite dishes, so I get a lot of inspiration from that. Uh, just as well, what can I say? It's like... I love trying new things, and every so often, something will catch my eye to the point where I want to give it a try. I mean, that's how I discovered that um, chocolate slime, for instance. Uh, not to mention things like uh, peanut butter chicken and uh, cold cannon, for that matter. Um, all I can say is, you know, just keep an eye out. Don't be afraid to try new things. I think that is something I very much recommend. You know, don't be afraid to try new things. I've, um, I've developed a mantra over the past few years, or the past decade or so, and basically that is, um, if I find myself saying, I've never tried this before, then I have to try it. 
And from that, I've discovered a lot of wonderful new foods that uh, I never would have uh, thought of trying in my earlier life. You know, stuff like Vietnamese pho, which is one of the, which has got to be among the greatest noodle soups in the world. Uh, even French puck of vin, which I had never had before I tried it myself. And boy, did I fall in love with that. Cheap New York fried chicken, which I went into about a week or so ago. <laughs> oh, so many things. Not to mention things, again, like Cole Cannon. Um, and there's so many things on my list yet that I have yet to, tr that I have yet to try. And you can say that the same for everyone as well, I hope. <laughs> All right, how are we doing here with these comments? All right, I hope we're not locked up. I guess that's the other thing. Um, I'm seeing a little thing, uh, thing around the live. Okay, so you need a bigger stove. Yes, I do, quite frankly. I need a bigger apartment. Unfortunately, well, number one, the lockdown happened this year, so uh, a lot of us were pretty much stuck where we were. Right now, winter is coming, and now I have some uh, some uh, family living with me that I was not expecting, namely the cats. So all of this considered, I'm probably stuck here at least for the winter, but I do intend on making a good effort to find really the right kind of apartment, one with a gas stove, come next spring. But until then, we do what we can. <laughs> uh, the food, Thai food uses peanut butter also. Salad dressing, chicken satay, very good stuff. Oh, yes. <laughs> yet another thing that I have to try making, and that is, of course, satay. <laughs> Love your big pot. Well, I do hope you were lucky enough to find one yourself. Oh, yeah. Anyway, back to the subject. Remember what I said? Uh, if you uh, acquire yourself a cast iron cauldron, you find this thing is really, really rusted, you know, full of grit. For all you know, it may have come from somebody's backyard. It may be full of old dirt and leaves. And as I said, rusted all through and through. So what do we do? Especially since a pot of that size may not fit in a, in a five-gallon bucket. Uh, like a cast iron pan would. So how do you clean this thing out? Well, what I find is um, when I cleaned out my um, big cauldron, I did the stupid thing, although I don't regret it, so maybe it wasn't so stupid, but I went and found myself a uh, container big enough to fit that. Now, uh, they have these... Um, trash bins, not just trash buckets, not just plastic trash buckets that you can buy at places like Family Dollar. We're talking like, uh, they usually they use them at industrial sites. They're usually green, they're short, but very, very wide, at least two, uh, maybe more than two feet wide, and they don't come with a lid, unfortunately. Those industrial waste bins, those things are fantastic. I went and got one of those. It has been, and I've been using it as a live tank for the last, oh God, it's been almost five years already. Well, apparently it has. And yeah, that has worked fantastic. First of all, it is lye resistant. Five years as a live tank. And no, it has not affected the tank. So, uh, though, so even though it was a bit of an expense, gotten a lot of use out of it, I can put a ton of cast iron into it. If you can't afford or can't find or don't have the room for one of these, another option would be to just take the pot itself and fill it with lye so that you can clean out the inside at least. As for the outside, it may be necessary to do it the hard way and actually start scrubbing it with things, you know, with steel wool, with, um, with uh, barkeeper's friend, um, and uh, just uh, give it a good going over. This is the type of thing that would probably be an all afternoon or hope or all day project, hopefully not all day. But it is the type of thing that, yeah, there's no denying. It's a lot of elbow grease. Um, and then, yeah, so you, as I said, you fill the inside of it with lye to clean out any um, natural uh, debris and stuff on the inside. After that, you cannot just wash out the inside as well. And as I said, this is going to be a big project pretty much no matter what. 
Um, on the other hand, here is one thing that electrolysis uh, tank makers probably know, and this is really useful for doing big things like this, and that is to use the cauldron itself as an e-tank, as an electrolysis tank. Instead of putting it in an electrolysis tank, use it as the tank. Fill the, uh, fill the cauldron with your electrolyte solution, you know, your washing soda and water. Um, you, and get your uh, sacrificial piece, you know, the part that's going to uh, take in all the rust. Put it on a string or something and hang it in the center so that it does not touch the bottom. Then you take your electrodes and you clamp one of them right to the side of the pot and the other to the, to the sacrificial uh, electrode. And lo and behold, you get to clean out the entire inside of the pot using electrolysis. It will not affect the outside, unfortunately. Electricity really only travels on the surface. It, uh, it would not go through. Um, I do not know, though, if, if, you could be, if you could get an electric shock from it. To be honest, I didn't try that. However, it only cleans out the inside of the pot, but it does a great job cleaning out the inside of the pot, and you've got yourself something that is as, really as good as you can get. Okay, now that we've gone this far, let's see what we can do to ensure this thing is well cleaned. I mean, these sausages are well cooked. The easy way to do that is let's steam them carefully. Notice I'm doing this to protect me. Here we go. Uh. So there, that should help get those sausages thoroughly cooked. And then from there, all we'll have to do is check the temperature, hopefully in just a few minutes or so. In which case, then, we'll be able to uh, take out the coal cannon, and we will embark on the last part of this. Hmm. I really hope I am not locked up. I mean, as far as I can tell, this thing looks like it's still going live. Um, I'm worried about, you know, the comments not coming in. I'm hoping we haven't locked up. Um... Other than that, as I said, it looks like I have, a, I have a full Ethernet connection. So I can only hope again that um, things, are, things are going okay. I really can't tell much on this end, unfortunately. Oh, I am live. Thank you very much. Thank you for letting me know. Thank you, Jacqueline. Still here. Okay. <laughs> I was a little worried. I, and I understand, of course, that folks are just keeping this in the background. I mean, after all, it's not exactly the most exciting thing. <laughs> but nonetheless, I, I can say I enjoy myself. Um, well, as I mentioned already, uh, so again, we have used the, you, we have used the uh, cauldron itself as an e-tank. Once you've done that, and as I said, it's probably going to be like an all-day project here. Uh, after that, to really get this thing all cleaned out, you just get, have to give it a good scrubbing top to bottom. Finally, after that, comes the seasoning. And here is where probably the easiest way to do this is, in fact, with a, uh, an outdoor burner. I mean, unless you actually have a grill big enough for this. Um, um, let me see. I know some people do cooking over a fire. And yeah, if you're careful, I'd say yes, you can cook it over a fire. I'm, no, I'm not a fan, as you know, of throwing it into a fire. And believe me, I am not saying do that. Do, please do not do that. There's too much of a chance that it could, in fact, crack. But what you do is, again, you uh, get yourself a uh, propane burner. In fact, there's this great video that I've used as a reference for years. Um, it's by a guy who calls himself Cohort. 227. And if you look that up on YouTube, you can find the video How to Season a Big Cast Iron Stew Pot by Cohort 227. And what that guy does is he actually uh, hoists it by a big length of chain, turns it upside down over the burner, and that helps to uh, season out the inside as well as the outside. Um. Uh... You underestimate your ability and the reason why we came here when you go live. It's very entertaining, very informational. You just keep showing up so you got something good started here. Well, thank you very much. 
as I said, I'm having a lot of fun, and I really appreciate it. it you know that you that you're enjoying this. There's really not much else I could say. I'm not a professional entertainer. I'm not a professional anything. Not a professional cook or anything, or chef or anything. But hey, I'm enjoying myself. I think that's really the big thing. And once again, I can only thank everybody so much for showing up. Uh, I'm actually not done yet. No, because I'm a little behind schedule here. I have a third dish uh, coming on, and um, and that should be as soon as these sausages are done, which, as I mentioned already, is the cold cannon. In fact, take that out. Where the heck is it? There it is. Time to get out my thermometer. So that we can uh, test the temperature of the sausages. That's my place where you can see it. There we go, that'll do. As you know, sausages should be cooked to at least, uh, well, they say 155 degrees. I would go to the at least 165. And it says here we're at, oh, yay, we've just jumped to 178. Let me take this out just to be sure. This one here is 185. Oh, my. Okay, yeah, I'd say these sausages are done. That actually did not take as long as I feared, and I'm very happy about that. So, uh, Clay Gennard, Bob, great idea, but in the area he was in, that would be historic house, a lot of money. Well, yeah, <laughs> I know. Well, who knows? Maybe I'll win the lottery. Ha, ha, ha. Maybe I'll cast a money spell. Yeah, right. Yeah, if that works. Uh, okay. Nonetheless, hey, we've got some sausages. Hmm. Well, we eat these just by themselves. But the last and hopefully best dish is coming now. Put these aside for the moment. Oh, good. I really hope this doesn't splatter up the ham. All right, and now comes the last dish. As I mentioned before, I prepared this before the video started. It has been boiling now for an hour. Didn't I actually running a little late, so this should certainly be done. Here's the Griswold Dutch oven or cauldron. It's really the same thing. And we have Carl Cannon. In fact, we have to drain it. So give me a second. Try that again without the water. And there's still a little bit of water. Hold on, I'm gonna have to drain it a little more. Told you I'm not a professional. But let's do this one last time. Ow, 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 ow. Okay, gotta get a different pot holder. That's the problem is I actually got some of the water on this. All right. There we go, another pot holder. Now, take three. Mm. At last. These are the type of things you don't see on those cooking shows or hopefully on some of those other YouTube channels, but there we are at last. All right. As I mentioned, Carl Cannon, which 
which is why I call this extreme mashed potatoes, because that's basically what we have. We've got our good old russet potatoes here as the base. To this, we also put in a whole bunch of shredded cabbage. Um, now, if you're going to feed your kids on Halloween, of course, again, you can tell them that you're going to be having extreme mashed potatoes. You don't have to tell them about, about the cabbage. <laughs> also, in here are some diced onions, and I throw in some spinach because I really like the taste of it. Um, that's optional, and anybody from Ireland will probably say, no, you don't, you, you don't add spinach, but I like it. And besides, it gives it a nice green Irish type of color. So to this, we are actually going to... Uh, let me quickly, I should have taken this out of the fridge. Give me another second. Come on, where the butter? It's not one thing, it's another. Once again, and then running around so much, I hadn't had the chance to get these out. And here, now comes the fun part. You just throw in a stick of butter, just like you would with any mashed potatoes. That's essentially what we're doing here. Throw in a stick of butter, if I can get the paper off. Oh, yeah. This is why, it's, even though they call it great value, the value is really not that great, is it? That's all right. Oh, come on. Ha. And to this, we add, okay, now, I already salted the water before, so all I have to do now is add in a little ground pepper. Finally. All right. Now, of course, we throw in just a little bit of basil. A little bit of parsley. And you could just mash it up as is because this is really great stuff even without. However, oh, yeah, I can have to do this as well. Throw in... About a cup or so of milk. There we go. As I said, you could just mash this as is. However, the nice thing about the cold cannon is you're actually throwing some meat. Literally, just throw in these sausages and we are going to mash them all together. And that's why this is extreme mashed potatoes. And here's where I get to bring out my giant masher again. <laughs> I think I told the story of this, and so yeah, you can go ahead and say, so you think he's compensating for something? I think this masher is big enough. <clears throat> uh, yeah, the masher here, let's get started on this, was because, like so many people, I had a cheap masher from, I don't know, from Wally World or Dollar General or something like that. And of course, you know how those things seem to last all of about two weeks or maybe mashed potatoes two or three times, and then it all starts, and then it just breaks. I got tired of that, and I said, you know, I'm going to go and get myself really an industrial strength masher, the kind they use at restaurants, because I want to be able to do some heavy-duty mashing. And so I went to Amazon and looked for a masher and ended up getting this thing here it was actually fairly cheap. I think it cost maybe a little less, like maybe eight to ten bucks or so. So, in fact, it mentioned four inches, and I thought that was talking about the entire length of it, but apparently four inches was the uh, diameter here, or the width of it. And so when this thing came in, I was shocked to see that this thing was so big. However, it works. It does a great job mashing potatoes. So because of that... 
I enjoy it very much. So anyway, Irish dishes, as you may know, like it or not, and I apologize to anyone who's Irish here, are infamous for basically you take whatever it is and you just boil the hell out of it. And that's Irish cooking. Well, maybe that's true because coltanen is one of is pretty much a traditional Irish dish. And what have we done? We have taken a whole bunch of um, veggies and boiled the hell out of them. To this, though, we are mixing in some sausages. Hmm. That is going to give it a nice spicy flavor, along with the uh, basil and the, and the spinach and the like. And so as a result, we don't just have mashed potatoes here. We have extreme mashed potatoes, and that's why I call it that. That's not really an official nickname for it. However, if you're going to say, oh, yeah, and, these, and this dish really was intended for, well, Samhain, you know, Halloween. Uh, it was actually meant as a dish to be made for that time of year. Of course, it's so easy and so cheap, you could make it any time of year. But yeah, if you are actually doing trick-or-treating this year, I know a lot of people are not, but any other year too, if you want to, you know, it's best to uh, that your kids eat before they go out on before they go out trick or treating because you know with a full stomach they'll be less likely to tempt you know to uh, sample some of the candy before they bring it home for your inspection. And so one way to do that would be to uh, cook some called cannon or extreme mashed potatoes because really this has pretty much everything that kids like. It has sausages in it, and who doesn't like mashed potatoes? Like I said, you don't have to tell them about the cabbage. <laughs> but nonetheless, that's what we have. There we go. As you can see, it does not, it's, it's absorbed all of the liquid. And so, we've got ourselves a pot of Irish called Cannon to go along with our African ground nut stew, which by this time, turn this up a bit, I think. It looks like it still has a ways to go, I'm afraid, but nonetheless, that's why I wanted to prepare the cold cannon as the second part of this video here. So, nonetheless, I do have a video on, uh, on uh, ground nut stew as well, which you are free to look at, and that uh, shows you the end result as well as uh, what we see at the beginning here. And above all, I really hope you do give this a try. I mean, I know that's pretty much a standard for any uh, video, any uh, cooking video. Uh, you know, it usually goes, and please, I, please do try this yourself. Be sure to like and subscribe and join my Patreon, etc., etc. Well, I really enjoy these dishes, and I am very, very flattered when occasionally I get word from someone say that they've actually tried it and liked it. That is really the, about the best compliment I could, I could receive, and I'm very, very grateful for that. Also, if somebody tried it and didn't like it, please tell me why, because if I'm doing something wrong, I want to know so that I can stop doing it or do it the right way. But anyway, at this point now, I think we are starting to run a little long here. And besides... We've got three dishes here, all done in cast iron cauldrons. I've talked about restoring a cast iron cauldron if you're lucky enough to discover one. And of course, Halloween is coming. Hmm. We've got our groundnut stew. We've got our uh, coke cannon. And once again, we've got our chocolate slime, which again, before you actually touch it, it looks like just regular pudding. But as soon as you try Doing that, it hardens. So this is really good for pouring over ice cream. However, don't heat it up because if you do, that is actually going to dry it out and it ruins its uh, consistency here. So really, the best way, maybe you might even want to uh, maybe put this over uh, something hot. But nonetheless, after only a few seconds or so, it just looks like regular pudding until you do that. And there we go, I guess. 
as always, I do hope folks have enjoyed this, and I hope it's been a little educational in some way or another. <laughs> May want to grow some room first. Yes, indeed. Oh, yeah. Pot is going to fall. Yeah, that's my worry as well. I will be moving this pretty much as soon as the video is done. <laughs> I'll put this one back here. But there we go. Uh, where did you get the recipe for the pudding? Well, I got curious and I did find uh, recipes for oobleck and then I found chocolate oobleck and I found edible chocolate oobleck, none of which seemed to be satisfactory, not what I wanted. What they were really most talking about was the kind of oobleck that kids can play with. And while it is edible, it's not exactly something that they would eat. So... I ended up uh, trying it myself, and uh, this is what I came up with. And I have to say, I like it. I mean, yeah, all the cornstarch in it, it is a little dry, I admit, which is why you could eat it by itself, but uh, I really do think you should, in fact, pour it over something like ice cream or something, or something hot and sweet, perhaps, something hot and sweet that goes with chocolate. But if you do so, I feel you will have yourself a nice... Chocolate slime for Halloween. <laughs> and as always, I very much appreciate everybody uh, how everybody is hanging around here. This, again, has been a lot of fun. So, well, have yourself a great Halloween, everyone. Please be safe. I mean, this year, as you know, has been really, really trying. And, of course... Please vote next Tuesday or before next Tuesday. I'm not going to say anything else about politics, but please, voting is important. This year may be more than anyone we've had in our lifetimes. Um, whether or not you vote for whoever, uh, there are other good reasons to vote as well. Your community could very well have a, um, you know, did I do this right? Yeah, yeah. Your community could very well have ballot questions to answer as well. And those certainly affect you probably more, more than you may think. So that's a good reason. Another good reason is that uh, at, at a lot of polling stations, a lot of times some slick bureaucrat will dress up in a suit and go out to read to meet the commoners, which means you, you get to see the sight of some rich guy in a suit Shaking everybody's hand, shaking your hand, trying to act really all nice and civil and groveling to you. And that's really actually pretty funny entertainment. <laughs> that may be worth going to the polls in itself for, but even if but if you if you vote early, like I did, again, there's still the question of the ballot questions. So yes, regardless, even if you're even if you want to vote for J.R. Bob Dobbs or some other writing candidate, please do because it is the duty of an American citizen to take part in the general election. So please, everyone, please vote. And that's all I'm going to say about that. Okay. Nonetheless, thank you so much. And once again, I will quote my favorite movie, 2001, and say again, see you next Wednesday. <laughs>